Can't believe I still have eight more seasons to talk about. Holy shit. When we last left off, we had just finished looking at season six and seven of Supernatural and an era that's generally looked down upon when the show is looked back at retrospectively. While in recent years, season six and seven have been seen in a more positive light, it's still very clear to see that there was a huge step down from the first five seasons in just about every way. Following season seven's critical and fan reception, longtime writer and current showrunner Sarah Gamble stepped down from the helm and went on to develop other projects, the most notable being the Netflix original You. When it came to replacing Gamble, the network looked toward a fairly popular writer that left after season 5, and that writer was Jeremy Carver. Jeremy Carver wrote plenty of hit episodes from seasons 3 to 5, episodes that I genuinely consider to be one of the best of their respective seasons. Season 3's mystery spot is easily a highlight of the entire show, season 4's In the Beginning and Death Takes a Holiday are classics, and season 5's Changing Channels is not only one of the best episodes of the show, but it pretty much feels like a trial run for Carver future show Doom Patrol. So I guess that it should be a little bit surprising that I've titled this era as the Dark Age of Supernatural, right? Jeremy Carver's run encompasses the 8th through 11th seasons of the show, with myth arcs that span the exploration of purgatory, demon tablets, the politics of heaven and hell, as well as the primordial concept of darkness. After stepping into the showrunner's shoes, Jeremy Carver immediately decided to do a soft reboot of the show in order to free it from the weight of its own mythology and lore. A direct quote from himself, States. The one thing that struck me watching season 7 was I felt like the show got a little bit buried under its mythology. It became a little too hard to tell exactly what was going on at times. The longtime fans all deserve intricate plot, but it felt a little burdensome. Resetting our mythology was one idea that I tried to bring into the show. I can't say that Carver was necessarily wrong, but I feel like in rebooting the show, it didn't help the show as much as he had hoped. Carver pulled everything back into the biblical side of things and delivered seasons light on monster lore and heavy on angels and demons. He also set up a three-year plan, as he called it, that would take him to the end of season 10. Said plan, we now know, was the darkness being unleashed, and that plan happened in season 11 instead of 10. At some point, Carver realized during season 9 that the show would probably go beyond just season 10, so he ended up stretching out his plan by a single season. Unfortunately, rather than seasons 1 through 5 where every season felt like it was building up to the next as a natural consequence, that being the apocalypse, and seasons 6 and 7 which built up to the release and defeat of Leviathans, seasons 8 through 11 feel like every season is a standalone in entry into the finale randomly introduces some new threat that wasn't even established prior. This creates the illusion of a comprehensive myth arc spanning multiple seasons without actually putting in the work to craft the storyline in a believable and fleshed out manner. It feels less like seasons 1 through 5 and more like a traditional CW show like Arrow or The Flash. And that's not necessarily an issue, but for a show like Supernatural with a history of building intricate plot lines over multiple years, it's a bit of a shame that Carver was never able to make his anything more than a way to bridge cliffhangers. He had an endpoint, but no road to get there, so it just ends up feeling a little hollow. In ways that I'll explain as this video continues, too much of his era feels like it's bogged down by reused plot lines and just a general misuse of concepts that made the prior seasons work as well as they did. A lot of episodes just chug along without any real sense of momentum, and the focus on angels and demons conflicts just feel stale by this point. That being said, I do have a decent soft spot for this era of the show, despite the title referring to it as The Dark Age. I don't hate any era of Supernatural, and I love most of the show, and two seasons that we're going to be talking about today I really like. Meanwhile, I don't have very many nice things to say about the other two. A lot of the groundwork for the final run of the show actually begins here, and there's still enough interesting and exciting concepts introduced in this era that I'm honestly glad the show made it this far. Now that everything else is out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about seasons 8 through 11 of the hit show Supernatural, also known as the Carver Era. Supernatural Season 8 ran from October 12th, 2012 to May 15th, 2013. It features 23 episodes, and the main myth arc of the season is the Demon Tablets and Closing the Gates of Hell. The Demon Tablet was introduced within this season, but tablets were introduced within Season 7, actually. They introduced the Leviathan Tablet straight to the end of Season 7, and it really does feel like they were building up to Season 8, and it does a decent job at bridging these two eras together. I've always had a soft spot for Season 8 of Supernatural. While not flawless, I feel like it's a decent step up for 
from season six and seven, while also managing to clear the board and streamline the existing mythology. Unfortunately, in doing so, the show does feel a bit more meandering and boring than it did, even in the prior two seasons. No matter how I felt about the actual writing, season six and seven always felt fresh, and the introductions of radically new concepts managed to keep me engaged, even when the direction might have felt far from coherent. Season 8 is also the first season when the show really feels like it's recycling plot. While Season 6 and 7 might have felt like they were spinning their wheels a few times when it came to Sam and Dean, Season 8 outright redoes plot beats from Season 4. This time, instead of Sam and a demon, it's Dean and a vampire. This plot is made even worse because Sam is written insanely out of character throughout this entire arc. The cracks show themselves pretty early when Sam outright refused to look for Dean when he was in purgatory. I don't mind the idea of Sam seeing this as an out and giving up, but the fact that he did it immediately rubs me the wrong way. Not only that, but his refusal to even look for or help Kevin just doesn't fit Sam at all. For someone like Jeremy Carver to completely miss the core concept of Sam as a character just blows me away. And when it comes to Dean's relationship with Benny, Sam's constant attitude towards it just makes little to no sense, as Sam has always been the one who wants to believe in the good side of monsters and doesn't see things in black and white. Like, this goes all the way back to season two. This is not a new concept for Sam. This has been in his character since the beginning. The potential here for this plot to help Dean see the good in monsters is palpable, but it's undone by the writers completely misunderstanding Sam's character purely to create the laziest friction possible between the two brothers. And that's not even mentioning the failure to capitalize on purgatory by having Dean escape in episode one and just tell the rest in poorly paced and meandering flashbacks. I understand that Jeremy Carver wanted to get Sam and Dean back as quickly as possible, but it just makes the season seven finale cliffhanger feel even cheaper than it already did when it happened. And the biggest problem with the first half of the season beyond character writing is just the lack of a direction. While I still do really enjoy this season, particularly the back half, which I'll talk about in a moment, I can't lie and say the pacing is great. The first half bounces around from episode to episode with little more than Crowley showing up, kidnapping Kevin, and then leaving. We're introduced to the concept of closing the gates of hell as early as episode one, but the first half of the season is more focused on poorly handled Sam and Dean drama than it is in properly setting this arc up. Luckily, there's some really, really fun Monster of the Week episodes that keep the first half from being truly dreadful. Episodes like Southern Comfort and Hunteri Heroicy are really fun and funny episodes that put a nice spin on the Monster of the Week format. I just wish more progress was made on the plot front. Also, just a quick side note, the, the Sam girlfriend plot already has a myriad of issues, but I think my favorite part of the entire plot is how there'll just be episodes where Dean will say something and Sam will just start staring off into the distance and be like, oh, this is just like me and Amelia. Like one episode, he's talking about living in a dream world and then all of a sudden Sam has a flashback uh, where one of the characters in the flashback says the same thing about the dream world. And I know that it's just a way to bridge the two together thematically, but it is so forced and obvious that it just it gets a chuckle out of me every time I rewatch season eight. Not to mention they literally do the whole like my dead military boyfriend is back from the dead. Now I have to choose plot line with Amelia and it's just, it's it's so it's so fucking stupid. <laughs> I guess the good news is that almost all of these issues are resolved by the end of the first half of the season, paving the way for a much stronger second half and one that features probably my favorite myth arc in the show after the first five seasons. It's almost funny in a way how the show shifts gears as soon as we hit the end of episode 10. In a way that can only be described as course correction, Sam's girlfriend's plot is dropped and Dean decides to part ways with Benny. In one fell swoop, all of the annoying drama between Sam and Dean is swept under the rug and we're thrown into the two being buddy-buddy as they attempt to close the gates of hell. Sure, one could argue that happened too neatly and quickly, but and honestly, nobody really liked the plot lines in the first half, so it's better that it happened this way. And the second half of the season is, with one exception, straight gold in my eyes. It's really the best stretch of episodes for the show since season five. None of them are like super amazing, save for the finale, which I really like, but most of them are pretty great. I'll go ahead and get one bad episode out of the way because it's truly quite terrible. The episode in question is titled Man's Best Friend with Benefits, and it's one of the most insanely written episodes of the entire show, and not in a good way. Even escaping the uncomfortably sorta of racist idea of a white man having a black woman as his familiar, the episode is completely bogged down by the constant storytelling issues that always plague witch episodes in Supernatural. They just don't make much sense. And it was also really boring. The second half of the season also stands out from the first when it comes to new concepts that we get introduced to. There's the Secret Society, the Men of Letters, which is legitimately one of my favorite concepts the show has ever introduced, and it gets expanded upon in super cool ways throughout the next few seasons. There are also episodes with Titans, Nazi necromancers, and even a group of teen hunters fighting vampires. Okay, that last one isn't as cool, but seriously, the ideas and plot lines given in one-off episodes in the back half are really, really interesting and exciting. It's one of the few 
things that you can actually benefit from when you scale your mythology back so that you can introduce new concepts. The myth arc of closing the gates of hell is, like I said, probably my favorite myth arc since season 5 at this point. Not only is the concept cool, but the execution is pretty exciting as well, and I love the idea of these trials. Sure, it may not be perfect, I think they lollygag a bit too much between said trials, but the idea of three trials designed by God to seal the gates of hell is just too cool for me not to love. All three of the trials are really awesome too, I think killing a hellhound, saving a soul from hell and delivering it onto heaven, and curing a fucking demon are really really awesome, and each of these episodes are really exciting and fun to watch which allows the myth arc to feel as grand as it should. I do think maybe we could have gotten a few more trials, maybe that would have allowed them to have more plot focused episodes in the back half because the back half is still really struggling to keep the main plot going, but this is the first and last season where Sam gets a storyline after season 5. The trials are killing him but he's okay with that because he feels like he doesn't deserve to live and is genuinely heartbreaking stuff and it's a really great evolution of his character up until this point. Believing that the trials are purifying him of demon blood and being willing to die to save everyone is such a satisfying end point to Sam as a character that it's almost a little annoying that he doesn't die in the finale here. Sure it's a little bit of a reboot of season 5 but if you're gonna remake something at least remake something good right? Speaking of the finale is easily my second favorite of the show. It's just so utterly well done and not only in the tension but the dialogue and conversation between characters is so so well done. Crowley and Sam's discussion in the church is fantastic and does a lot to elevate Crowley to new levels as a character and the scene between Sam and Dean where Dean tells Sam to let it go is one of my favorites in the show. All of it is made better by the twist ending that Castiel is getting played by Metatron to expel all of the angels from heaven. Castiel's storyline this season especially at the end is pretty strong. I love seeing him want to make things right with heaven to the point where he trusts the clearly evil Metatron and goes as far as casting every angel down. It's very well done and of course the final shot of the angels falling is the best ending to a season finale the show has ever done. Seriously, it's just one of the most raw and compelling visuals the show has, and it's crazy, but this moment alone really puts Season 8 higher in my head. There are a myriad of issues with Season 8, I know, I talked about all the problems with the first half, but there are issues with the second half. I already said the myth arc really does struggle to sustain itself. Um, we spend way more time trying to decipher the trials than we do actually performing them, and that can lead to a lot of the tension becoming deflated. Crowley as the main villain is another thing I'm not sure worked too well. He sort of ends up feeling a bit lame, even compared to Dick Roman before him and I really would have preferred someone completely new to be the villain, especially since this isn't Crowley's first time as an antagonist. That being said, maybe it's better to use Crowley because the season's secondary antagonist Naomi really wasn't much better. While I said I do love Castiel's arc, I mainly meant in the final few episodes because when he's spending the season trying to figure out who's hacking into angels, shows words, not mine, and feuding with Naomi, I just really didn't care all that much. Although I do want to say the episode Goodbye Stranger is really, really cool for Castiel's arc, and I like seeing how he kind of goes between real life and the scene with Naomi telling him what to say. It's really, really cool, and it's one of the few parts that does a lot of interesting things with it, even if the rest of the plot line's kind of whatever. I am really glad that it ends well, though, with the season finale, which again, one of my favorite season finales of the entire show. Overall, I really do enjoy season 8. Again, issues aside, I think the back half more than makes up for it, and while the first half may have issues, there are a lot of fun Monster of the Week episodes within it that makes it worth watching. I give Season 8 a very light 8 out of 10. It is the best season since 5, but it's still nowhere close to like Seasons 2, 3, 4, or 5. Maybe a little close to Season 1, but even then, just, you know, we still have a long way to go before we get there. The best episodes of the season include Episode 23, Sacrifice, Episode 22, Clip Show, and Episode 19, Taxi Driver, with a special mention to episode 2 of the season, What's Up Tiger Mommy, where Sam Winchester wields Mjolnir and kills somebody. Yeah. The worst episodes of the season are Man's Best Friend with Benefits, which is episode 15, season 8, episode 7, A Little Slice of Kevin, and season 8, episode 3, Heartache. The only one of those that I truly don't like is Man's Best Friend with Benefits. Isn't it funny though, I gave season 6 a 6 out of 10, season 7 a 7 out of 10, and now season 8 I gave an 8 out of 10. I wonder if that means season 9 will get a 9. Yeah, I, mean, I think we found the back cave. Hello all, and welcome to the first interlude of this video. Basically, these interludes are things that I can't really fit into the rest of the season segments, so just think of it as like the merchandise video and my anime video just included with the rest of the retrospective. I wanted to take some time away to talk about one of the coolest concepts introduced in the show, the Men of Letters. The Men of Letters are protectors, beholders, observers, and chronicles of all things supernatural. They're a secret society, and they spent most of the time cataloging and creating a wealth of knowledge to help hunters exterminate all that goes bump in the night. The coolest part about the Men of Letters is 
perhaps the bunker, which is introduced through season eight and acts as the main base for Sam and Dean. Now the show really isn't a stranger to a central hub. In season two, they had the roadhouse every few episodes until Eric Kripke burned it down because he didn't like the idea of Sam and Dean having a home. He must have changed his mind though, as by season four, Bobby's house essentially took over the role and acted as the main base for them until its destruction in the second episode of season seven. From then until season eight, episode 13, Sam and Dean kind of just floated around through motel rooms before settling down here in the coolest set of the entire show. It's really fun because while Bobby had a lot of lore in his house, as the series goes on and expands, it really does make sense to change the amount of lore books that they would have. The things that they have in the Men of Letters bunker is completely different than what Bobby would have, so I really do like the slow, you know, creation of more of a library of sorts, I guess. On the official season nine Blu-ray, there's a wealth of special features, including a tour of the bunker as the set designer walks you through every little nook and cranny of it. And the amount of detail that sprawled all throughout the multi-level set is staggering. Here, you'll also see this line of sigils uh, once again, uh, embedded in the floor. And even aside from the cool lore implications of it, I think the bunker is one of the coolest sets made for a network TV show. The Men of Letters themselves are home to some really, really dope episodes, including two of the best episodes of the next season, season nine. Part of why they're so fun to me is just the way that they expand on the lore and world of Supernatural. It makes sense that there'd be a secret organization that's all about helping hunters, and so seeing it is really, really cool. Granted, it is weird that it takes until season eight to introduce it, especially because they're so heavily tied to Henry Winchester, who's John Winchester, Chester's father, but it's really cool and I'm really happy that Carver decided to introduce it. It's probably the one thing from his run that I do not think the show would be fine without. You really need the Men of Letters to make the second half of the show work as well as it does. Throughout seasons 8 through 11, every season gets a pretty fun episode dealing with the Men of Letters, whether it's about a member kicked out for using black magic, flashbacks to Henry Winchester on an excursion, a magical suicide box, or even a woman of letters sneaking aboard a US submarine during World War II. There's so much done with this idea that I just absolutely love it and again the way that they're able to expand upon the idea of having a central hub with lore books and everything is just really really cool because the men of letters have things on everything it's also just an easy way for writers to have Sam and Dean know things that they probably shouldn't know I'll talk about it a lot more in my next video because season 12 does a lot with the concept, but I really just wanted to draw some attention to it because this becomes a staple of the show and the introduction has always been one of my favorite elements. Also just the symbol of them, the Aquarius star is really, really cool. I just want to say that I, I like the, the symbol and again, the bunker is just really dope. Henry Winchester is also a really, really fun character and I feel like a prequel surrounding him would have been very fun. Too bad the CW is in the business of pointless retcons and creating a prequel show that makes absolutely fuck all sense and seems to exist just to drive me to the edge of Supernatural Season 9 aired from October 8th, 2013 to May 20th, 2014. It contains 23 episodes and the myth arc of the season is the Angelic Civil War as well as the Mark of Cain. <sighs> Unfortunately, Season 9 is not a 9 out of 10. Season 9 is not even good. In fact, I'd say it's pretty bad and the worst season of the show by a fairly large margin. Up until now, the worst season of the show was season 6, but instead of me thinking that season was truly bad, it was more like it was my 6th least favorite season of the show. Season 9 is not like that. It's hard to truly pinpoint where season 9 went wrong. I think the biggest part is how it feels like they're constantly retreading ground without a single new idea. The main plot of the season, the Angel Faction Civil War, is literally just a repeat of season 6. Now I know that a show that's 9 seasons in is going to inevitably redo some plot lines, but season six was only three seasons ago by this point. And not only that, but it's handled far worse than it was in season six. And that season, the war was something that we only heard about in passing. Castiel was fighting battles we couldn't even imagine. All the while, he was constantly pulled out of it to help Sam and Dean with things that are just minuscule compared to what he's doing. It was actually compelling in season six and one of the better parts of that season. In season nine, we're treated to boring and plotting expository driven scenes about the politics of angels after their fall from heaven. And it's simply not engaging and it was never interesting to see these poorly acted angel characters feud. The only time the storyline begins to get remotely interesting is when Castiel begins to lead the army, but even then the storyline continues to spin its wheels. Metatron is another issue with the season. Now don't think I'm slandering him. Curtis Armstrong's performance of the Scribe of God is quite wonderful and he's a very funny character, but he's a terrible, terrible villain. I can never take the character seriously and anytime he attempted to be menacing, I just felt insulted. His constant obsession with writing and knowing the ending eventually just grated on me and it's not fun to 
to have a villain that knows everything, especially just some stupid Seinfeld reject like Metatron. And the culmination of the entire story with him basically becoming God and calling himself X and Marv just... How did we get here? How did we go from Azazel, Lilith, and Lucifer to this? He makes even the weakest villains like Dick Roman look like the best villain the show ever had. And then there's the murder of Kevin, which just... Why did he have to die? What did he even add? It just adds to the torture done to the show's few non-white characters. Abaddon is a far stronger antagonist this season, and the plotline with her and Crowley battling over who controls hell is a far more interesting plotline than the Angel version. It's still nothing great, but it actually feels like there's something to it, and by centering the storyline around two characters that we know, it actually made me care a little bit more. It's a lot better than whatever the hell was going on with Bartholomew and Malachi, just two characters that I've never seen before, and the worst part really ends up being that Sam and Dean have absolutely no role to play in the Angel War. The entire story is either told through Castiel or these random new characters. At least with the Demon War, we have Crowley and Dean's relationship was grow stronger throughout the entire season, as well as Dean taking on the Mark of Cain to fight Abaddon. Something like that never really happens with the Angel War, and even when they try to make it happen, it just doesn't really work. Part of what makes me love Supernatural is how the main characters react to the current arc, and without that, you really don't have Supernatural. Season 9 isn't without compelling ideas, I want to add. The Fall of the Angels is one of the best things Season 8 did to the show, and the potential was there to tell a compelling story about how these things have never lived on Earth and how they would react. Unfortunately, the show drops that very quickly, like I said, and it just devolves into a boring civil war. I just wish we got to sit with more how the Angels reacted. There's a cool little plot thread with the angels using a radio pastor to tell everyone to accept angels as vessels, but it's dropped just as soon as it's introduced, and honestly, so are the most interesting storylines this season. Remember when it was revealed that Abaddon was harvesting souls all across the country to make a demon army? The show didn't either by the end of season 9. Castiel's brief stint as a human is one of the few things the season has going for it right out of the gate. We're treated to a lot of really great moments with the character, and it feels like a solid and natural progression to him following the end of season 8. It ends up getting dropped in the mid-season finale, though, and we're instead given a boring arc about Castiel needing to kill angels and keep replenishing his grace, because that makes sense, I guess? And then there's the concept of Gadriel, which leads to the worst drama the show has ever seen, but I'll hold off on that for one moment. The idea of Sam having an angel inside him is cool to me, I really love seeing Jared Padalecki switch between playing Sam and Gadriel on a whim, and it really led to a ton of great character moments. Gadriel himself is also pretty fascinating as a character, but he feels a little undercooked. For as cool as it is to have it, the little angel that lit loose into the Garden of Eden, that's kind of high stakes to just be a minor antagonist, right? Why wasn't he the main villain instead of Metatron? The season does end up getting somewhat of a kick in the ass during the middle of it when we're introduced to the Mark of Cain and Cain himself. It's a really compelling story idea and I loved meeting Cain. Unfortunately, the Mark of Cain plot pretty much goes absolutely nowhere besides allowing Dean to wield the MacGuffin to kill Abaddon. And after that, the plot is all about how Dean has to go sicko mode and kill people. There's even this hilariously stupid plot line where Dean gets sick if he doesn't kill people. It like what? And it's not compelling to see Sam and Dean bicker over stupid shit like this. And speaking of bickering over stupid shit, wow. As much as I like the concept of Gadriel's plot, the fact that Dean tricks Sam into being possessed and keeps him from dying is just so fucking bad. Not only does it completely go back on Dean's character development in season 5, where he learns to let his brother be his own person, but it is just such a giant overstep of Sam's bodily autonomy. The following drama that occurs is absolutely horrible. Despite understanding Sam's side of the situation, Dean's side is so horribly skewed that I cannot understand how someone manages to even slightly defend him. Contrast this to season 4, where both Sam and Dean's sides made complete sense and the drama felt frightening and real. These were two brothers who were torn apart in a genuine felt like nothing would be the same after their falling out. When Sam says they're not brothers anymore in season 9, it doesn't carry the same emotional weight because you know they're just going to move on and get over it. And now it's time to talk about the true number one issue with season 9 of Supernatural bad episodes. From plot episodes to the Monster of the Week episodes, season 9 is full of episodes that are just not good. From an episode where Dean tries to manipulate a former porn star into sleeping with him, to an episode where Sam and Dean battle fat suckers at a weight loss retreat, the season is just full of episodes that make you want to drop the show, and that's not even talking about the worst episode of the show, Bloodlines. Look, I don't find anything particularly wrong about a show deciding to dedicate an entire episode to a backdoor pilot, but some things need to be done. For one, a backdoor pilot that takes up an entire episode should be focused on characters that we 
we know. You can't just take time away from the main characters to derail and detail an entirely new show with people we've never met. Secondly, the backdoor pilot needs to be good. Bloodlines is neither of those things. The concept of the episode is admittedly interesting though, several monster crime families battling over turf, but the execution is horribly done and it just becomes a dreadful waste of 42 minutes. The episode alone is a thesis statement on why season 9 is the worst season of the show. Because this episode, like the main myth arc of the season, has nothing to do with Sam and Dean. They are just random passerbys watching things happen and sometimes deciding to intervene. I really wish I had more to say, something more profound, but honestly at the end of the day this season just bored me. Episodes were a chore to get through and even the one-off episodes felt lacking in originality and ideas. If one truly good thing came out of season 9, it's the plotline with Crowley and Human Blood. Crowley was a character that I was honestly getting kind of sick of, especially after season 8. I just didn't really feel like he was adding much to the show, and his consistent like turns and flip-flops as ally and villain were just getting super, super annoying. Luckily, this season decides to actually give him some depth and actually turn him into a character that became one of my favorite characters by the end of his run on the show. So good job there, season nine. You actually did something interesting. I can only hope that Jeremy Carver simply didn't care about the show during this year because if he thought these ideas were good, I really have no word. Overall, season nine was not a nine out of 10, as instead a solid 4.5 out of 10. Best episodes include episode 16, Blade Runners, episode 17, Mother's Little Helper, two back-to-back -back good episodes, both dealing with cool men of letter storylines, and episode 5, Dog Dean Afternoon. Yes, the episode where Dean becomes a dog is one of the best of the season. That really tells you what we are dealing with. Worst episodes include episode 20, Bloodlines, episode 22, Stairway to Heaven, and episode 19, Alex, Annie, Alexis, Anne. Fun fact, season 9 is the first season of the show to not contain a single 9 out of 10 episode. It's really not good. Well, 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 we just finished talking about season nine of the show, and I really did not have a good time watching or really talking about it. It's just a complete waste of mine and everyone else's time. So why not just sit back and listen to me bitch more and more about the show because it is the dark age of Supernatural and not just for the content and the seasons because even the good seasons have issues. And one of those issues is the visual look of Supernatural and how it has degraded over time from seasons one through five to where we are now in season nine. Within the first few seasons of Supernatural, there was a distinct look to it and a vibe for the show. Just look at these moments from season one. Look at how the shadows work, the horror aspect of the show is baked into the visuals. Sure, they do slack off as the show moves on, even into season three, but there's always the grayer and toned down look of the show and the effort was still put in to preserve a specific style. Now look at season eight. There's a distinct change in how the show looks. The outside shots are so much more bright and washed out. Look at how this scene looks. What? Now let's look at a similar outside scene from season five. Sure, it still looks like a mid-budget TV show, but there was clearly effort put into it and a clear style trying to be conveyed here. There's also a distinct change in direction. The first few seasons have some awesome moments that are very well done and extremely fun to watch. Those days are basically gone now when you get to seasons 8 and 9 when everything feels so thrown together in stock that it's almost like all of the care is gone. I know a lot of the reason that the show looked as good as it did was because it had Kim Manners, who was big in the X-Files and a huge, huge help to Supernatural, especially in its early seasons and having its visual identity as he was an executive producer on the show and directed some of the best episodes of the first five seasons. I'll just go ahead and play a clip from this video by Jeremy Hannaford to show exactly what I mean when I say that the direction has completely changed and not for the better. Something that I always found myself complaining about with Supernatural in the latter seasons was the lack of a kinetic camera. For the most part, if not every conversation was shot on a static setup. Very little variation other than basic over the shoulder blocking. Take this scene with the brother seeing their father in the 300th episode. The camera never moves in, nor does it vary. It's very static, and while it may just be a conversation, take a look at how Kim shot the brothers meeting their father in shadow. The brothers and John move around the room, just as the camera does. There are multiple angles, varying from wide to close, capturing the intensity of the reunion, of their emotions, of their burdens. In terms of comparison, it's fairly similar, but it's that variety that adds to the scene that makes this conversation stand out for more than just what it was. When you get the chance, please watch the full video. It's a fantastic video and it says everything that I'm trying to say in this interlude way better than I could probably ever say it myself. Please check out the rest of his channel as well. He does some great supernatural videos and he's one of my favorite YouTubers. Even if I barely agree with his opinions on the later seasons, I always love what he has to say. Um, and he was just great. Thank you, Jeremy 
me for letting me use the clip. It will be in the description. Please check it out. Even in seasons that I still really end up enjoying, like season 8 and as you'll see, season 11 down the line, I really, really do become just completely awestruck when I go back and look at seasons 1 through 5 and just see how much better the show looked then. And I just really wish the show was able to maintain that throughout all of its 15 seasons, and maybe I'm wrong to expect it to, but I think just a little bit of effort would have gone a long, long way. But now, let's go ahead and get right back into the video, but not before I uh, hit up my friend who's seen season 9 and get his input. Oh, the EBT stand club's going on. Let's, uh, let's see what's going on here. Maybe we can talk to Aiden. Rick and Morty. Yo, what up? Yo, what's good? It's been a while since I've been in this group chat. I've been edit in this video but did you see the black adam poster i did i did it looks fresh looks pretty cool um so i've been working on this video and i, I wanted to ask you because i know that you've seen uh the ninth season of hit cw show supernatural unfortunately um <laughs> i want to know what your what your favorite episode of the season was um so there's just one episode with the with the fat suckers right mm -hmm. abysmal it's, it's it. not good it's, it's not good there's another episode with the with Bartholomew as well. Love Bartholomew. Awful character. Oh, Hate but it. yeah, absolutely. Hate, Hate Bartholomew. It. There was this like one episode with some ghost chasers though. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the ghost facers. I love love them. And they, they're, they, some, uh, they're some good boys. They going after the thin man. The thin man. And yeah. then we get the the twist that one of them created the thin man. To keep the other one still doing the ghost facers behind Bro, his back. Just straight gaslighting. And straight gaslight. And it was a direct parallel to the Sam and Dean drama going on this season. Sure. Lied to Sam to get good drill to, to go inside of him. So it kind of really makes sense. The theatrics of mm. the season were, were really at play in that episode. Um, oh, yeah. So I'm, uh, it also was a Slenderman ripoff, so that was pretty funny. Um, yeah. I'd hate to kick you out, but me and Zach were working on our Minecraft build of uh, Sands and Papyrus from Undertale. So, unless you were wanting to join, we kind of have to finish that. Oh, well, is it is it like a is it like a realms or is it a server? It it's a it's a realms, but only for like specific people we're allowing in. Okay, you know, okay. it's a very tight knit group right okay. now, for sure. All right, yeah, that that that's fine. Cool. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'll see you later. Enjoy the the Minecraft uh, sculpture. We'll, we'll we'll do. Go ahead and uh, I'll put a I'll put a picture of it in the uh, the video. So. Oh, thanks, thanks, bro. All right. What a bunch of losers. Supernatural Season 10 aired from October 7th, 2014 to May 20th, 2015. It has 23 episodes and the myth arc is the Mark of Cain. The Season 9 finale was really bad. It featured a bunch of just bitching and bickering about the Mark of Cain before Dean went to fight Metatron who was going by Marv and pretending to be God and healing people and it was just really stupid. And then Metatron kills Dean at the end. But <laughs> Dean became a demon. Yep. Dean's now been a human, a soul in hell, a vampire, an old man, a dog, and now a demon. All that's probably left is a woman. Dean becoming a demon is one of the most batshit, out of left field ideas, and it was arguably the perfect way to cap off a season where nothing good happened. I won't say the idea isn't cool, but I will say that it was a clear alarm bell of this show is out of ideas. The good news? Season 10 actually handled the concept of Demon Dean and the Mark of Cain in a decent way. The bad news? Season 10 is an utter mess of a season with a myth arc that just bounces around every few episodes. The running core theme behind the entire season, sure, is the Mark of Cain, and eventually Dean corrupting and turning into a demon again. Again. On the surface, it's just a remake of season 3. Instead of dying in a year, it's going to turn Dean evil, but the arc that Dean goes through is too similar for it to be an interesting retread. He begins the season not wanting to help himself, but eventually learns that he doesn't want to do this. So as far as character stuff goes, it's just boring. Demon Dean has a solid opening and the three-part story is pretty good. I'm actually glad Demon Dean doesn't last longer than these three episodes because it would end up running into the same issue Sola Sam did, where you sort of just want Dean back. Nothing about Demon Dean is exceptional though, and some of the 
things they do end up feeling a bit half-baked. Dean's demeanor never really felt too changed from just the generic Mark of Cain Dean, and while his hijinks with Crowley are fun, I never really understand why Crowley ended up wanting him gone, because Demon Dean never really did anything super terrible. With Demon Dean neutralized in Episode 3, the writers must have realized that the season was like Season 3 without a true villain, and they needed to shop something up. What they end up doing isn't very good though, because like I said, this season is a complete mess of half-baked plot lines. We start out with Rowena, Crowley's mother, and I guess she is fine. I really think she grows into a much better character down the road, but she's just sort of annoying in Season 10. Most of her scenes revolve around her shrill voice manipulating Crowley into doing something, and it just never really worked for me. She's sort of a villain throughout the season, but eventually ends up teaming up with Sam to remove the mark of Cain from Dean, and I think this was a good choice for a character because she starts to become a bit more palatable. And then there's Cole, the ex-military guy who is hunting down Dean because Dean killed his father, a monster, one night when Cole was a kid. This plot is interesting because by the time that Cole finally finds Dean, Dean is a demon, and it raises a lot of interesting ideas. Cole views Dean as a soulless monster, and that's exactly what he is at this moment. Unfortunately though, when Cole does come back, and Dean and him, you know, face off with Dean being a human, the plot is just kind of dropped randomly, and that element is thrown away, so that's fun. Then there's the issue with Kane. Kane appears in a single episode of this season, which is episode 14. And while the episode itself is actually pretty solid and features a great climax with Dean resisting the mark and trying to kill Kane, this felt like a finale to a storyline that we never really got. The episode spends most of its runtime doing what should have been done over the span of the past 13 episodes and delivers a second half that feels like a climax. I really wonder why Kane wasn't the villain of season 10. Having Dean try to confront him is a cool idea, so shoving it into a single episode has always been baffling to me. Why does Metatron get to be a villain throughout, like, the entire era of the show, but Kane only gets two episodes? This is the biggest mispotential of this season, and it honestly pisses me off. Lastly, there's a Stein family. While I said Kane is the biggest mispotential, I think this is the most interesting concept and the closest thing to villains that actually feel like they get a full plot. The ending of the Stein family is a little shaky, I will admit, but it's an actual conclusion with Dean murdering them all instead of just dropping the plot lines like Kane and Cole. The idea of a family orchestrating so much is really cool, and I wish they'd stuck around for longer, but it's just another instance of a ton of ideas that never really coalesce well. The season also reintroduced Claire, the daughter of of Castiel's vessel and a storyline with Castiel wanting to reconnect with her. Unfortunately, this too was basically dropped after episode 10, and sure there's a resolution for it in episode 20, but it never really feels like a fully developed plot and something more like they did because they've struggled with Castiel after season 5. I will say I do like what they do with it, I just think it could have been a lot more. I'm not saying that you can't have multiple plot lines in a season or multiple main villains segmented like this, but instead of feeling like each villain gets their own arc, Supernatural season 10 just throws things at you and then drops the plot before moving on to another thing that they're going to throw at you. In a lot of ways, Season 10 is similar to Season 6, but I almost feel like Season 6 was more coherent. Season 6 sprinkled all of its plot lines throughout the season and managed to merge them all together by the end of it. Meanwhile, like I said, Season 10 just throws things at you, drops it, and then throws another thing at you. I do think Season 10 manages to be a bit stronger than 6, though, as a season, because the final stretch with the Stein family is pretty good, and the Mark of Cain stuff is pretty interesting, only a little bit better than season 6 though. Unlike season 9 where the final stretch of episodes killed the season, season 10 was in dire straits before episode 17 as it would turn in terrible episodes like the things they carried or paint it black. The final stretch of episodes offers a great look into the core dynamics of the season with Dean not wanting to hurt anyone just so that he can be saved and Sam going so far as to literally end up with Charlie dead and working with a witch. Again it's all a repeat of season 3 but it's almost more interesting because the stakes are higher and the characters actions are even less justifiable. The Book of the Damned is a really cool idea and having Bobby break Metatron out of Heaven's Prison is really awesome and the finale is one of the coolest episodes of the entire season. I will say the finale is just a remake of season 4's finale with one of the brothers doing something, the other is doing something else, and one of them learns that the other is doing is going to lead to something insane, breaking out. In season 4 it's Lucifer, in season 10 it's the darkness, and by the time both of them are able to talk it through, it's too late and that thing escapes. I guess the thing is though, unlike season 9, if you're going to repeat something, at least they repeated something good. Season 10 does amplify a major issue with this era though, and that's the way that the era handles building up to the next season. I already talked about this, but the Kripke era was one big story, even if it wasn't planned out in stone. The way it was written was that each season was a chapter that directly led to the next. The seasons 8 through 11 are not that, and I really think that it hurts the show. Carver worked under the assumption that each season could be the last, so we end up getting season finales almost feel like series finales before one final twist is thrown in. So on the surface, it feels like everything led to the next, but it actually doesn't. Season 8 may feel like it's leading 
leading up to the angels falling, but it really, really isn't. And sure, season nine has the mark of Cain, but Demon Dean and the mark of Cain feel completely different in season 10 than they do in season nine. And sure, you could say that the mark of Cain is responsible for unleashing the darkness, but we never learn about the darkness until the finale. Not even the beginning of the finale. It's like the last 15 minutes of the finale. Take a look back at season four and the entire main plot of the season operates on the concept that Lucifer is going to escape. Imagine if season four was just about tricking Sam into going dark side and then we learn in the finale that Lucifer is what the demons want out. The finale and the season as a whole is a lot less interesting when you don't have that dread and tension building up. So what ultimately keeps season 10 above the worst of the show? Some banger episodes mostly. The 200th episode fan fiction is an absolute highlight of the show and the episode Ask Jeeves just feels like an Agatha Christie novel in Supernatural. The episode is a huge delight. About a Boy is a fun little episode that not only lets you get some fun hijinks of Dean as a teenager, but the moment that he learns that he's free of the Mark of Cain adds a lot of emotion to it. And the Werther Project has some really cool twists that make it a memorable episode. Seriously, the reveal that Rowena the entire time was the box tricking Sam into killing himself made for such a great cap off to an episode that already served as a really stunning example of a Monster of the Week episode done right so late in the show. Unfortunately, a lot of the Monster of the Week episodes this season do in fact suck, but we need to talk about the episode Halt and Catch Fire. I like to view this episode as a sequel to Mannequin 3 The Reckoning, an episode that is so terrible, so insanely bad, that you almost have to wonder if it was written to purposefully emulate a bad B-movie. This episode is an absolute highlight of the season, and it is not a good episode. <laughs> the season yet again also has a middle chunk that just feels really dull. Much like season 9, the episode stretch of 11 through 17 is mostly just filler, and not even memorable filler. About a Boy is really the only exception, because the things they carried and painted black rival season 9 for some of the worst episodes of this era. Pacing is something the Carver seasons really suffer with, and it's something that I really hope I like more in the next era, because it's just such a big issue here. <laughs> like, you have the first couple episodes of the season which are plot related, and then episodes like 4 and 5 and 6 are filler, then 7 may be plot related, and then uh, 8 is, is filler, and then 9 and 10 are plot related, and then 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 are almost all filler with maybe 13 or 14 being plot, and then they shove all the plot in in the final stretch of the season, and it just makes for such an annoying binge watch. It is pained me seeing it and it continues into season 11 too i'll talk about it there so yeah season 10 is okay i guess it's a season with a myth arc that is not planned out at all feels like someone is changing their mind every other episode and it struggles to be compelling throughout it starts decently and ends pretty decently but the middle of the season is a meandering mess of plot lines beginning and ending without really connecting to one another at all overall i give season 10 a 6.5 out of 10 it's watchable has some highlights and is a step up from season 9 but it's barely better than season 6 and 7 and 8 are a lot better for me in terms of enjoyment Best episodes of the season include episode 5, Fan Fiction, episode 19, The Werther Project, and episode 23, Brother's Keeper. Worst episodes include episode 13, Halt and Catch Fire, the Wi-Fi Ghost episode, but this one's actually one of the best episodes of the show, even if it's terrible. Episode 15, The Things They Carried, and episode 16, Paint it black. Well, I've officially talked about 10 seasons of the show, so now I figure it's time to talk about characters, and more specifically how I feel like Jeremy Carver's run on the show really, really got the characters wrong. I've already tackled season 8, so I won't talk about that too much here. My main focus is on season 9 and a little bit of season 10, because those seasons absolutely struggled the most when it came to how poorly the characters were written. Starting with season 9, I already touched on how Dean manipulating Sam is awful, but it really is such a horrible moment for Dean's entire character arc. His character throughout seasons 1 through 5 was was all about him finally accepting Sam as a person and that he has grown up and can make his own decision. Vice versa, it's also the first time that Sam has complete control over him and makes the ultimate sacrifice. The first choice that he's ever had and made entirely of his own free will is to end the apocalypse and essentially lock himself in hell with Lucifer forever. These issues were already prevalent in the season 8 finale. I still really do love that episode and the conversation between Sam and Dean in the church is fantastic, but Dean talking Sam out of sealing the gates of hell is basically like if Dean stops Sam from jumping into the cage in the season 5 finale. I could overlook this if Dean and Sam actually discussed it in season 9. Still, instead, Dean manipulates Sam into being possessed by an angel and genuinely just becomes a terrible person all around throughout that season. Meanwhile, Sam is completely nothing in season 9. He's just got an angel inside of him and he hates it, but when he figures it out and it just kind of goes nowhere, he just fumes at Dean for episodes on end and he says they're not brothers anymore and he gets an admittedly good moment when he tells Dean he wouldn't do the same and bring him back, but unfortunately the season's terrible finale undoes 
does that by having Sam say he lied and that he was not okay with Dean dying. Sam then spends the entirety of season 10 trying to save Dean, even though it leads to Charlie's death and the release of the darkness. This leads to another issue where it feels like everything Sam does is just thrown back at him like it's the worst thing he ever did. Everything is his fault. Even in the season 8 finale, when Sam asked Dean where he should start when he asked for forgiveness from God, Dean says, losing your soul, working with Ruby, like he's just throwing insults at Sam to where it almost feels like the writers don't even like him. Furthermore, Sam takes complete responsibility for having the Mark of Cain removed from Dean and releasing the darkness, when maybe if Death had told them beforehand, because he's like almost omnipotent, he could have done something about it. Very weird how the show seems to continue to lob blame at Sam and things that just feel manufactured. Sam's actions in season 10 just make no sense and it does not line up with Sam's character in season 8 where he didn't look for Dean, or season 9 where he said he wouldn't care if Dean died. Dean's character in season 10 takes a funny swerve as well. As soon as Dean becomes a human again, he's more compassionate and kind-hearted than he's been since like season 6. It's almost as if the writers realized that Dean and Dean was barely any different from how Dean acted throughout season 9 and decided they had to make a pretty radical change. And you know, Castiel is an entirely different story, but the issues with him really cannot be summed up in a short segment like this. He really went from having the best character arc in the entire show to being a character that sits around and does nothing but talk to other angels with the most boring and uneventful dialogue. I decided to talk about these issues between seasons 10 and 11 because I do genuinely feel like season 11 is a step in the right direction for a lot of the characters. So why don't we go ahead and talk about season 11, also known as the best season of the show since season 5. Supernatural Season 11 ran from October 7th, 2015 to May 25th, 2016, features 23 episodes, and the myth arc is The Darkness. Well folks, we finally arrived after a slump for multiple seasons that only really improved for a minor chunk of Season 8. We finally arrived. Let me slap a big ass button that says Supernatural is good again, baby! While Season 11 is the first season in a really long time that felt genuinely fresh and exciting like the show had its mojo back, Season 10's final stretch was a pretty decent upward swing in quality. While I like season 8, the first half really meandered and hurts the overall project, and 9 is just not good and the bulk of 10 feels meandering and pointless. For episode 17 of season 10, I feel like the show really got itself back together for a long stretch that all culminates in the end of season 11. Season 11 features something that this era has been missing, and that is a compelling season-long myth arc. Season 8 features parts of that with the trials, and I really do like those, but the trials are introduced and dropped and reintroduced and dropped again every 5 episodes or so that's hard to really understand what direction they're going in. It wasn't until about episode 14 that that arc finally picked up, and even then they would still go weeks without fully pushing the story forward. Seasons 9 and 10 drop the ball as far as myth arcs go, but I'm tired of talking about those seasons. Season 11 is different. We jump right out of the gate with this, and it's pretty damn good from the start. The darkness immediately poses a credible threat, and Sam and Dean's battle with these rabid creatures in Nebraska is one of the most memorable season premieres for me. The second episode in particular, Form and Void, is one of the most memorable episodes of the entire era as Sam struggles with not only being infected, but trying to cure everyone around. Him. It all culminates with him praying to God and being sent a vision of his time in the cage, and this is the episode that truly told me that Supernatural was back. And the quality continues because not only do we get an entire 9 episodes, while there are a few meh points, I feel like one of the hottest streaks we've had since season 5. Baby is a truly magnificent episode where the entire episode is shot from inside of the Impala, and just my imagination not only introduces imaginary friends, which by itself is such a batshit concept, but it manages to flesh out Sam and give him a lot more character than he's had in ages. Unlike most most seasons too, the first half of season 11 is incredibly story focused, which helps the main plot feel as strong as it really should. Episodes 1 through 3 are entirely focused on the main storyline. 4 is baby, so it's based, but episode 5 starts like a monster of the week episode and turns into being about the darkness, or as I'll call her now, Amara, stealing people's souls. Episode 6 is also plot featuring the first time run-in with Amara, and 7 and 8 are monster of the week. It is just my imagination, so it all works out in the end, and 7 is, it's whatever, it's a decent enough episode. While it might have been episode 2, Form and Void, that truly convinced me Supernatural was back, it's this episode right here, episode 9, which truly cements this season as one of the best of the show. Oh Brother, Where Art Thou is the culmination of Sam's continued visions of Lucifer in the cage, and seeing him visit the cage and talk to Lucifer is so damn compelling and exciting. Meanwhile, while Dean finally gets to talk with the darkness and realizes that she and him share a connection, and by the end, they will fuse as one. It is insane, it is batshit, and I absolutely love it. The Devil in the Details has Lucifer take Sam on a journey through his greatest highs and lowest lows, trying to beat him down until he eventually says yes to him so that Lucifer can walk topside again. In the end, though, Sam tells Lucifer that he's ready to die and watch his friends die, but he's not ready to be Lucifer's bitch. It's such a great moment to see Sam finally take back his agency and tell Lucifer to back off. Even if the back half of Eleven, Peter 
petered off in quality, and it really doesn't. These two episodes alone would put season 11 above 6 through 10 easily. And I think that all of this culminates in Lucifer escaping the cage anyway, taking over the body of Castiel. It's, ah, it's so cool. Misha Collins' performance as Lucifer is so damn fun and entertaining to watch. I've seen some people say Lucifer became too jokey and goofy here, but really, if you go back and watch episodes like season 5, episode 10, Abandon All Hope, Lucifer has always been like this. He's never been super serious like some people point him out to be. Sure, this performance is dialed up a lot and he may not be as menacing as he is sometimes in season 5, but I don't think it's out of nowhere. The pacing of season 11 is really great. The first half gets away with the darkness not just destroying everything by having her being born into a child and slowly grow up by consuming souls. It could seem a little dumb, but the execution of it is really cool and you also get multiple Villain of the Week episodes where monsters know of the darkness and it just adds to the tension and stakes. The second half is a bit weaker with the pacing, but it's still far better than usual. Sure, we get the normal stuff with Sam and Dean in the bunker without any leads in the main plot, so they go on a hunt, but here it makes sense because Amara is healing from the angels smiting her in episode 9. And it could be a little frustrating that the second half is so much less plot focused and more focused on filler, but I think it helps that unlike seasons 8 through 10, the Monster of the Week episodes in the middle point of the season are actually good. Episodes 16 and 17, Safe House and Red Meat respectively, are some of the most creative and awesome episodes of the show. Safe House tells two stories at once, with Bobby and Rufus in the past and Sam and Dean in the present as they invest investigate the same hunt, and it's just a creative and exciting episode, easily one I can rewatch over and over. And Red Meat is basically Romeo and Juliet, but with Sam and Dean, and has some of the best acting from Jensen ever. This episode genuinely feels like it belongs in the first few seasons. The main myth arc of the season does get a little bit choppy here in the middle though, because I believe Jeremy Carver stepped back from the show at this point to focus on his new show Frequency. This ends up creating moments where the story doesn't quite know where it's going. While The Vessel is a really fun episode with the introduction of Hands of God and time travel and the reveal of Lucy being out of the cage just him and Dean. The entire plot fizzles out once you realize they do nothing against Amara. I do want to state that this season does introduce the concept of what I have dubbed filler plot. In episode 15, Beyond the Mat, when Sam and Dean are revealed to be pro wrestling fans, the B-plot of the episode is Lucifer and Crowley bickering as Lucifer looks for another hand of God. This isn't super important to this video, but it'd be important for the dab era as this type of episodes become even more common to the point where you can't have a filler episode without the plot moving forward in some way. Luckily, things do get back on track pretty well with Hell's Angel as Lucifer tries to kill Amara and gets captured. Things are finally ramped back up, and while the next episode is pointless filler that has no point being there, the main storyline still goes in a great place. Perhaps the best episode of the season, Don't Call Me Shirley, does the most blasphemous thing ever and introduces, or should I say reintroduces God, also known as Chuck Shirley. And the scene where it's revealed is one of the best scenes of the entire show. The episode is 90% dialogue between Chuck and Metatron, and not only is it extremely compelling dialogue, but it almost makes Metatron's entire presence in the show worth it. Not only are these moments compelling, but the mere fact that God is on screen is funny and leads to a lot of really entertaining moments. God and Dean's conversation at the beginning of All in the Family is utterly fantastic, and I've seen some people take issue with the fact of how human God and Lucifer feel during their conversations, and that same complaint has been given to the dynamic between Amara and God as well. I quite like that. Part of what made Supernatural feel compelling to me is that the very core of all this crazy supernatural conflict is just two brothers and their relationship with each other. Even in seasons one through five of the show, Michael and Lucifer are clear mirrors of Sam and Dean, with one being the father's favorite but a rogue canon, and the other being a good little soldier that can't think for himself. What we get in season 11 just feels like a natural evolution of that concept, and it really makes the final leg of the season work more for me. The penultimate episode is where the big fight happens, and we get a ton of terrific moments throughout, with all culminating in a really cool fight where you think they've won, and Sam's going to bear the mark of Cain. Unfortunately, Amara escapes and basically kills God, which leads us into the season finale. Alpha and Omega gets a lot of shit. Hell, I've even given it a lot of shit in the past. If you watch some of my other Supernatural ranking videos, you may have seen where I say the finale is bad, but now I think it's a pretty good finale. The actual resolution of the season is as compelling as it could be, and I think God in the Darkness uniting and leaving is a great way to end off a season like this. I think season 11's real issue just comes from it not feeling as important as it should. Most of the episode just features God dying, but you never really feel the tension. They just have the son dying and they're all talking about God being dead, but again, not much tension to him feeling like that he is dying, I guess. I also think they force in so much season 12 setup that it just takes away from that tension a little bit. The British Men of Letters showing up is a little annoying and the final cliffhanger with Sam being shot is just weird. That being said, when it works, it definitely works as a conclusion to what was an excellent return to form for the show. I give season 11 an 8.75 
five. It is very close to a nine. If there weren't some pacing issues in the middle and the myth arc didn't feel scattershot in that period, I could also give it a nine very easily. And I also feel like if the finale were like a 10 out of 10 instead of a light eight, it'd get an easy nine for me as well. But as is still one of the best seasons of the entire show, easily up there with like seasons like two, four, and five for me. Complete enjoyment of a season. Love it so much. It ends off this era a lot better than this era had any right to be ended off. Best episodes are episode four, Baby, episode 20, Don't Call Me Shirley, episode nine, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, and episode 10, The Devil in the Details. Worst episodes are episode 19, The Chitters, episode 13, Love Hurts, and episode seven, Plush. This is the first season since season five to not have a single episode score below a six out of 10. It's a true step up in quality. I'm such a huge fan of season 11. So I'm a pretty big Blu-ray collector, as you probably see in the first couple episodes of this retrospective. I like to own the seasons of TV that I really, really like. And so I have owned a Supernatural collection for a little bit, but they were in these kind of dingy slipcovers, as you may have seen in the prior videos. So I decided finally to go out of my way and buy the official box set just for something that would last a little bit longer and wouldn't fall apart in a couple of years, because some of these slipcovers were already starting to run their course. So here we are, let's go ahead and take a look at all the artwork. There's a lot of really cool artwork here and a lot of really interesting looking um, things to see about the, the outside of the box set. It's a, it's a really nice look to it. I like the, the driving off into the sunset. I think that looks really, really cool. Uh, and then it lifts up the top like this to reveal all the Blu-rays and, uh, and everything about that. So it's a uh, pretty, pretty cool, uh, collection. There's like seven. Um, so let's go ahead and like look at some of these. So they, they split it up season by season. There's seasons one and two that are in this case. And all the cases have like the same sort of, uh, front cover image and each have an image on the back. That's from season one. Uh, they're all in here like this, which is pretty cool. Uh, you know, season three and four, we have Castiel from season four. Uh, seasons five and six, which is funny because you have the best season of the show followed up by one of the worst, but there's a shot from season six on the back. We have seven and eight, which is kind of funny because you're bridging the Gamble era and the Carver era together. So that, that's just kind of funny to me. It's a shot from the season eight episode. I think Southern Comfort is that one. Um, this is nine and ten. I'm pretty sure the shot on the back. Now it's from season nine, somewhere in the mid-season point i'm pretty sure so so the shot on the back there is from the memory remains from season 12 and and then at the end they compile seasons 13 through 15 and then on the back is a shot i'm pretty sure it's from episode 12 or 13 of season 15 um well i mean we'll, we'll get there eventually uh but you know it's a bit of a different uh layout you know they got the discs on there instead of all in the middle uh season 14 is blue uh, which kind of begs to mind, I wish that the, the discs were like color coded to the color, the title cards. Um, season 15 being purple is kind of weird to me, but and they, there you go. Um, I also would have probably had the symbol of the title cards on each disc instead of the, um, uh, the, just the same pentagram image, but you know, this is a special features booklet thing uh digipack i really wish that they would have had more than just season 15 on here maybe like show wide special features would have made it seem a bit more important as it is it's, it's whatever you know it's a decent little thing uh and then here's the real meat of the box set and one of the reasons i was very excited to get it i mean you have the eclipse with the fire burning behind it picture of sam and dean um a lot of photos from the the set